Distinguished delegates, participants, and dear colleagues, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining from. My name is Pınar Karakaya. I am an economist at the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva. And today I will be speaking on behalf of Mr. Dominic Bourjon, the director of our office. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the fourth session of the FAO in Geneva Social Protection Dialogue Series, organized in close collaboration with FAO's Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division in Rome. The thematic dialogue series on social protection aims to raise awareness on the role of social protection as a key instrument for poverty reduction and inclusive growth in rural areas, and in turn, as a key instrument for achieving the objectives and targets of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Through the engagement of distinguished speakers, the Social Protection Dialogue Series showcases concrete examples of achievements made by countries in strengthening and extending social protection systems as a core ingredient of their strategies, seeking to promote more resilient, inclusive, efficient, and sustainable agri-food systems. While being open to all, the dialogue series is primarily intended to foster discussion between participants and inform and engage with representations of member states based in Geneva. As you may already know, the first dialogue series held in September focused on pathways for extending universal coverage of social protection. The second session addressed the role of social protection for inclusive climate action. And the third and the last one to date elaborated on why and how social protection can and should be leveraged to anticipate and respond to shocks. Today, our session will seek to increase the understanding of the positive contribution of social protection schemes towards more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems by contributing to food security and nutrition, promoting decent and sustainable livelihoods, and supporting environmental sustainability at global, regional, and country levels. This dialogue is particularly timely as we are one week away from the UN Food Systems Summit stock-taking moment, which will take place in Rome from the 24th of July to the 26th of July next week. Today's event is the result of a collaboration between FAO in Geneva and FAO Social Protection Team in headquarters. Let me extend a warm thank you to the FAO Social Team, Social Protection Team, in particular to Marco Nose and his team for supporting the preparation of this series. Before starting, let me remind you of some housekeeping rules for today's session. The session will last about 90 minutes and it will be recorded. Please keep your microphones muted. We encourage you to post your comments and questions in the Q&A module throughout the session. At the end of the presentations, we will try to accommodate as many questions as the time permits during the Q&A session. Now I would like to give the floor to our moderator, Ms. Lauren Phillips. Please, Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pinar, and thank you for welcoming us all, uh, all of us. Um, and good afternoon, good morning to all of you. Uh, I am Lauren Phillips. I'm the Deputy Director of the Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division of FAO, which is co-sponsoring this event. And we have a fantastic um, set of speakers today. Um, and I think that you'll all find it's going to be a very rich conversation, learning from global, regional, and um, national experts on the topic of the nexus between food systems and social protection. Before I introduce the speakers and a little bit of the structure, I would like to just sort of open on why we're we're having this this particular session within the the context of the seminar series that Pinar mentioned. So um, last week, uh, FAO, in collaboration with its UN UN agency partners, IFAD, WFP, UNICEF, and WHO, published the new uh, SOFI report. The SOFI provides us an annual sort of update on uh, food insecurity, undernourishment, and hunger in the world. And the numbers that were reported last week remain much higher than we would hope with 735 million people um, ex experiencing hunger in 2022, which represents an increase of more than 120 million people compared to the levels that we were having pre-pandemic. So we were on positive trend of reducing hunger and poverty in the world until we had a series of joint shocks, including the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine. And the projections suggest that uh, out of line with the SDG objective to have zero hunger by 2030, 60, 600 million people will still be facing hunger in 2030. Um, and we also see in that report that a very large number of people, more than 2 billion people, are suffering from moderate or severe food insecurity. 
and that more than 3 billion people, so a very large percentage of global population, cannot afford uh, what FAO has defined as a healthy diet in conjunction with our partners. Um, now, we know that um, a, a huge number of people, in fact, almost half of the world, or nearly 4 billion people, um, are either employed directly in agri-food systems or are linked to households which are using agri-food systems to maintain their livelihoods. And a, a large share of those people are poor and vulnerable. Um, and given the series of shocks that I described, like um, COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, and especially climate change, um, the, this sort of set of combination is making it such that a number of people who depend on agri-food systems for their livelihoods face um, a number of challenges in accessing adequate and nutritious diets. Uh, they have troubles um, reaching uh, social protection services, agricultural insurance, and often, unfortunately, these kinds of food systems are failing to deliver decent livelihoods and equitable benefits for uh, people dependent upon them, despite the fact that we know that agri-food systems can be a, a very major uh, driver on reducing poverty and helping to distribute economic opportunities equitably. Um, and so in that context, I think it's clear that policies around agri-food systems and food policies are currently insufficient because they don't do enough to ensure that we reduce the number of people experiencing food insecurity or accessing healthy diets or having uh, good levels of nutrition, and that we need to have um, additional support mechanisms to ensure that we have decent, resilient, and sustainable livelihoods for that nearly 4 billion people I mentioned who are dependent on agri-food systems. And well-designed social protection systems are a really critical component of having an inclusive and sustainable agri-food system transformation. Um, and I think that our speakers will say much more about this because they help to achieve multiple goals like reducing poverty, improving food security and nutrition, helping people access decent jobs and ensuring that people have um, better natural resource management, which can help to strengthen their resilience, including to climate related shocks or other shocks. So that's the sort of framing of our conversation today. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our, our very distinguished panelists and how we're going to structure the conversation. So we're going to start with three keynote speakers. We have Dr. David Navarro, um, Mr. Renato Domez Gugino, and Mr. Navid Akbar with us. Um, David is the strategic director and the co-founder of 4SD, which supports agri-food system transformation across the world. He's going to kick off the session by framing a little bit the, the current context of crisis and how what the relationship is between social protection and food system transformation, highlighting some challenges and opportunities. And then we'll pass to the other two speakers who will provide us two very interesting country case studies from different regions. So first we'll hear from Mr. Renato uh, Gojinho, who's the special advisor for international affairs at the Ministry of Social Development in Brazil. He's going to present the government of Brazil's uh, ongoing efforts to improve the performance of agri-food systems and their use of social protection interventions to talk about food security and nutrition. And Mr. Akbar will then take the floor to present the actions taken by the government of Pakistan to improve livelihoods of workers and mitigate the impacts of climate change on agri-food systems through social protection. Uh, Mr. Akbar is the Director General of the National Socioeconomic Registry and Conditional Cash Transfer Program, um, uh, which is called the Benazir Income Support Program in Pakistan. Uh, I think that this will help us to see how social protection can contribute to building inclusive and resilient sustainable agri-food systems. So thank you so much for joining us. And after we hear from our three speakers, we're going to have a panel discussion, which will be led by Ms. Valerie Schmidt, who's the Deputy Director of Social Protection at the ILO, um, and Dr. Osame Badin, who's the Executive Chairperson of um, Academia 20, uh, 2063, which is an Africa-based nonprofit research organization aiming to provide data, capacity building, policy analysis to enable African countries to achieve the African Union's agenda 2063 of inclusive and sustainable development and shared economic prosperity. Um, uh, we will also have uh, Dr. Osman Badin provide insights about the African context. And so it's a pleasure to have you all here today. Um, let me go ahead that now and pass the floor to, uh, uh, to David Navarro, Navarro to introduce the role that social protection can and should play in the context of food systems and crises. Over to you, please. So, Lauren Phillips, thank you very much indeed for this invitation. It's absolute privilege 
to be on a panel with uh, Renato Godinho and Navid Akbar. And I'm super grateful to FAO in particular for making this possible, uh, all protocols observed. As Lauren said just now, in my brief remarks, I'd like to offer and why we believe from the UN Global Crisis Response Group that it is absolutely essential to make sure that protection can be made more widely available. I have four headings for my remarks. Crisis past, crisis now, protection need, and protection potential. I first got deeply involved in the current crisis in uh, the early months of last year, when I was invited by the United Nations Secretary General to be one of the leaders of the food work stream of his new global crisis response group on food, energy, and finance. The group in which I was involved noted that there is a deepening and interconnected multi-crisis in food, energy and finance systems that's being precipitated by cascading shocks resulting from COVID-19, accelerating climate change, violent conflicts, and increases in the cost of living, in many cases as a result of local currency depreciations. The Global Crisis Response Group referred to this as a cost of living crisis. And vulnerability assessments undertaken in 2022 and 2023 show just how dramatic this crisis is. Right now, 103 countries are highly exposed to perturbations in food, energy, and finance systems. That's seven more than a year ago. 48 countries are exposed to disturbances in all three of the systems. And that's an increase from 36 countries a year ago. Altogether, 30 countries over the last year have become more vulnerable and 11 countries less vulnerable. Of the very affected countries, 63 are most affected by financial systems challenges, 58 by food systems challenges, and 56 by challenges in energy systems. This is really an extraordinary crisis. And right now I am going to describe how we perceive it is feeding through and affecting so many hundreds of millions of people. Although prices are for food, fertilizer and indeed energy have come down in the last few months on the world market, they are remaining stubbornly high in many local settings. Life is becoming more expensive for people on low incomes, particularly in low income nations. As already been said, it's smallholder farmers and agricultural laborers who are particularly vulnerable at this time in food systems. Their households are sliding into deeper poverty and they're not able to afford the nutritious food, healthcare, education, and other basic needs they require for life. And it's especially women, children, older people and disabled people who are most at risk. 
in Canada, for example, with 18% of the population food poor, half of those who are identified as food insecure are also identified as disabled people. And if a country has a very tight national budget, it's really difficult rapidly to mobilize extra domestic finance to protect people at the level and speed required. About one quarter of the world's nations are experiencing high levels of indebtedness and expend much of their budgets on debt servicing. And indeed, debt servicing costs have shot up in recent months because interest rates have gone up globally. And the interest rates have gone up because wealthy nations are trying to control inflation. And some of them are doing very well. But the result is life is just much more expensive if you're a minister of finance in a poor nation and you've got much less to spend on supporting people who are in difficulty. I mean, it's not as though it's impossible between December 22 and May 23, the number of social protection measures that have been implemented rose by 31% in response to the various shocks. So there's a lot going on. But for people in debt saddled countries, and there are 59 of those, the problem is so serious because the interest payments are just growing so fast. 45 developing countries are spending more public resources on debt repayments than on enabling people to access health care. And indeed, globally, 3.3 billion people live in countries that spend more on interest repayments than on health or education. So what is to be done? Well, there's an enormous poverty slide underway. And people are suffering and they need protection. Otherwise, they will suffer in ways that will have long-term consequences for themselves and their families. Right at the center has to be the need for food and nutrition security and decent and secure livelihoods that respect people's human rights. And promoting universal social protection is key to an inclusive and sustainable transformation of food systems. Strengthening social protection and food systems is an absolute priority for achieving the sustainable development goals. And social protection as is an important investment in the future, but it's also a right a human right. And so accessible social protection schemes for consumers and poor households, for producers, smallholder farmers and agricultural workers is key. And the state of food and security and nutrition in the world report just referred to says that cash transfers are the most efficient way of doing so. So why, why are we worried? Why are we worried for women and girls in particular? And the answer is that globally, our safety nets are creaking and in some cases are collapsing. Right now, the World Food Program, which is the world safety net for people who are food insecure, is massively underfunded. Right now, indebted countries are not able to get the finance they need for emergency access to cash for social protection for smallholders, laborers, people on low income, the indigenous people, all with a view to protecting households, women and children. And if we don't manage to up the availability, people will search for food and for shelter.
People will suffer as they search and people will struggle as they suffer. And already we are seeing people are starving. This is an emergency that's really the crisis of my lifetime. And I commend FAO for hosting this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for these very important and quite stark remarks about the, the challenges that we're facing on uh, ensuring that governments and international actors can provide adequate protection to face the challenges that you that you laid out. Um, I'm going to turn immediately to our next presenter. So Renato, the floor is yours. Um, we welcome your sharing your experience of Brazil. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, speaking after uh, David's uh, stirring speech, I'll try to take the lead on that uh, crucial call for reinforcement of social protection schemes and social protection um, uh, safety nets. So this uh, Brazil is the country where, as you see very briefly here, um, if I can present, Sorry, could you go? Uh, you, I see you represent yourself. So can you go to the next slide, please? So as you can see, um, this the, the prevalence of hunger has come back to Brazil after the country has uh, been left out of the FAO hunger map uh, over the last uh, few years. Unfortunately, the situation has uh, deteriorated, and now from the numbers that were uh, announced uh, in the last SOFI, the food insecurity scale is too higher in its uh, moderate and, and severe scale. So that, that's the effect of a government that has uh, undermined some of the uh, social protection networks that were put in place uh, before, and also the effects of the pandemic uh, that, of course, like the much the rest of the world, has uh, and imperiled um, much of the way of living of people. So next slide, please. Uh, this is also briefly to talk about the, the effects of uh, malnutrition and obesity that, uh, that you, of course, know very much how uh, not only the deficiency in calories, but of uh, proper nutrients and sometimes the uh, the, the the exaggerated calories under uh, a lack of nutrients can lead also to obesity and malnutrition, even uh, without uh, the people being underweight. So this is the prevalence that was affected uh, in people of various age ra ranges in Brazil just last year. So next slide. So now coming to the crux of the matter, Brazil is a country that, uh, despite its problems, is lucky to uh, have the resources and the food production and the resources to put in place the necessary policies and networks to fight the problem. So we are uh, having, we are trying hard to put back uh, some of the the, the 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 programs in place that were undermined in the last government and uh, also trying to start new strategies adequate to this new uh, era. So this uh, is a very interesting concept uh, figure here that what you can say that the different dimensions of food security and nutrition, um that as as you know it's a very complex uh, multifaceted subject the very dimensions can be addressed by different policies and this requires uh multi-sectoral coordination and the role of social protection here uh, is very important not only as one would assume for access and consumption but we can also see there a link on how they can affect positively the production as well uh, next slide Um, here is the same concept, but translated in the systems that we have in place in Brazil. So specifically for Brazil, the national health system uh, under the Ministry of Health uh, promotes healthy eating, education in primary health care, uh, evaluates 
food insecurity, nutritional status, and provides uh, breastfeeding programs. At the same time, the social assistance, and here is, is key in, in the Ministry of uh, Social Development, where I work, um, they run the social assistance centers, uh, which is uh, 1,400 centers around the, the, the whole country, uh, providing different services to vulnerable families, um, and including the, the doorway to be in, um, to, for the, the families in need to be put into the what is called the single registry, uh, which is a huge database of all the families that uh, can be targeted for social programs. And uh, naturally, the Bolsa Familia program, the uh, headliner cash transfer program that uh, is being restored to, to, to its, uh, it, its proper modalities here in Brazil now after uh, having suffered from some deviations of, of purpose. Uh, and the Bolsa Familia program is, is the main, as David mentioned in his presentation, cash transfers. Uh, it's a cash transfer program that is indeed a very efficient way to fight the food security and nutrition and uh, provide a number of other benefits. And finally, there is in Brazil a uh, food security and nutrition strategy based on its law that uh, also relies on the other aspects, but has specific programs directed at uh, trying to secure um, proper food and nutrition to people, which we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail later. Next slide, please. So this. Uh, uh, is briefly to show you the governance of the system in Brazil for food security. There is an uh, inter-ministerial chamber for food security and nutrition, the Kaizen, that uh, uh, relies on 24 ministries to discuss and implement uh, comprehensive programs, uh, like some of those that I have shown. So um, each one acting in their own domains, but in a coordinated manner. And uh, most crucially, the councils for food and nutrition security. The Conseil is the national council, having a network of state level and even in many municipalities, municipality level councils for food security and nutrition, in which the civil society is, uh, is, is, is actually leading the process. So it's a consultative mechanism that then goes to the, the proposals go to the government and uh, every four years, this whole system congregates uh, in the National Food uh, Nutritional Security Conferences with guidelines and priorities for the plan for the next four years. So next slide, please. So this is an example on how both the family and the class transfer program contributes to malnutrition and obesity. So there, there was a study uh, done uh, a while ago, when Bolsa Familia was in the apex, that uh, uh, compared uh, children on Bolsa Familia that were there for four years as compared to those who were from a single year, uh, because of course we wouldn't be studying uh, families uh, that could qualify to the program and, and not give them. So it's impossible to really do the study with and without Bolsa Familia, mind you. So the, the study that was done was for recent entrance versus uh, entrance for four years. And uh, even with that, uh, that, that kind of, of baseline, there was a 50 lower chance of malnutrition in the, the children who were in the program enrolled for already four years uh, versus the recent entrance. Uh, along with a 10% lower chance of being overweight. So this um, and, and, and a detection of an increased consumption of the most important and nutritious food groups uh, in the, the, the children of the families that uh, had already stayed in the program for more time. So the Bolsa Familia is not an unconditional tras cash transfer. It has uh, conditions, including the enrollment of children in school, and in health, there is uh, a proper follow-up of, of uh, the health uh, schedule of the children, including the uh, being up to date with the vaccination and following uh, other conditionalities, including this monitoring of nutritional status two times per year. So uh, the 
the family has to be up to date on the, the services. So next slide, please. What happens now if the role of the uh, social assistance, the teams and the social protection that has the centers and dedicated uh, professionals uh, across the country? So the one of the most important service on the menu of this uh, system of, for, for social protection is called the Integral Family Attention and Protection Service, the PIVE. Uh, and it provides these, uh, among other things, they, they provide special attention to families that are in arrear with their conditionalities, the ones that I mentioned, including school and, and child health. And they can also point out uh, food security and nutrition issues for those families because the conditionality is not there uh, to, to throw people out of the program in case they don't comply. So when there is non-compliance, uh, with these uh, conditionalities, this service is uh, actionable to uh, go into the families, diagnose their difficulties, provide ways, and also point out maybe they can't uh, keep their, their kids in school because of lack of access uh, in their region and lack of uh, the, the proper offering of those services, crucial services by the state. Maybe there is no way for parents to, to leave their kids uh, or to find the, 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 the proper health set systems. So this, this is all uh, considered an essential strategy to overcome the gaps that are impeding fulfillment of those conditionalities uh, and then addressing not only the, the, the income, but also these other dimensions that could uh, perpetuate uh, hunger and poverty uh, throughout the, these, these kids' lives. Next slide. So here's another example of interlinkages between uh, different uh, systems and domains of food security. So the food purchase program is also a very well-known program in Brazil that is being restored right now that was discontinued. Uh, and it, 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 uh, with it, the government can ensure uh, prices for family farmers or with smallholder farming as it is more uh, uh, usually known uh, in, in English. So, and um, in the new legal framework that we hear, this, this, these purchases from the family farmers, they are destined, usually they were destined to the National School Meals Program. So this is uh, being restored, but now um, there is the, 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 the preparations on going to buy even more of the produce from family farmers to, um, uh, to go to the, the, the network for the social assistance network and the food and nutrition specific facilities uh, that we have in this strategy, including the, the popular restaurants that are subsidized restaurants, community kitchens and food banks. Uh, and, and also for private, uh, public and philanthropic uh, health, education, justice networks. So this is a broadening of the food purchase program. And what it does is not only provides uh, access to more quality, real food um, to these people in the school meals programs and those who are accessing these services, but also strengthening family farming uh enabling them to reach more scales to have more income and in this way uh helping uh to transform food systems so next slide please so i i i have uh, dealt with the 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 main programs and actions that we have had for a number of years now and uh, i'll now discuss uh strategies that are being put in place uh, for the next years that uh, are still being discussed. So this, the idea is to move forward for a strategy specific for the cities. So 85% uh, of Brazilians live in urban areas uh, as 80% as, as of globally produced food uh, in Brazil also consumed in urban areas. So next slide, please. Cities have their own, uh, their own needs, their own challenges. Uh, so sometimes it's easier to access food, but not any kind of food. So you have uh, heard the concept of uh, food deserts and food swamps. 
uh, which are areas on, on in the city that uh, are lacking in any kind of access to healthy, nutritious food, and instead providing only uh, low-grade, industrialized, uh, low low nutrient uh, food, and in this way increasing malnutrition, even if uh, calories uh, enough calories are consumed. So uh, many of the Brazilians detected with severe food insecurity live in cities. There is a lot of inequality between the urban groups and the, the geography in the cities. Um, and the difficulty to assess not only education about how to, uh, how to find and choose proper food, but also transport uh, to the, 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 the places where this food could be available. Next. Renato, I hate to interrupt you because it's super interesting, but if you could finish, we are um, yeah, we're yeah, running I'm, over time. I'm about Thanks. to wrap up. Yes. Great, thank you. So here's to give you just a, a, a brief example of these um, installations, no? these facilities for food security, including the community kitchen, social restaurants, the distribution centers for the food uh, purchase program. Next. And also these family supermarkets. So they are all uh, serving themselves with uh, these food from family farming. They have some help from governments at all levels, federal, state, and municipalities. And this is the kind of thing, uh, next slide, please, that we are uh, mapping uh, to provide a comprehensive support to. Please, next slide as well. Uh, the the uh, urban agriculture program is also being put in place. Uh, it's something that uh, cities are already starting and the national government wants to support as well. Next. Uh, this is the, the final slide here, just to summarize and integrate how this national strategy for food and nutrition security in cities uh, would integrate the programs that I mentioned before already existing, uh, better integrating them for cities, the mapping of food deserts and the integration of these facilities to promote, to promote the supply of healthier food, the urban agriculture program and the strengthening of uh, family farming uh, promoting these shorter uh, production and consumption circuits for the population in the city. So this is uh, our, our next level that we want to delve in. So thank you very much and uh, apologize for, for going a little bit ahead, but it's a very interesting subject. I would say that if we were to, to build a new global pact or alliance on, on food security and nutrition, social protection has to be in the forefront. So going from the words of David, so not all countries are fortunate to have the means that Brazil has to put this in place. So those countries that would uh, join this pact should be helped by those that can help to, to, to make this a reality because we know it works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renato, for the super interesting presentation. And um, I'm really I was impressed by the amount of coordination uh, and the mechanisms that you mentioned. In fact, there's a question about that in the chat already. Um, let me pass to uh, Mr. Akbar, um, Navid, over to you, please, to give us a little bit of a sense of the role of social protection on ensuring inclusivity in climate action and to talk about Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here to present Pakistan's case. Um, let me share my screen presentation with you. Um, hope you can see the presentation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll quickly start with uh, the country's context to just let you know about, about our country a bit and the social protection. Uh, the key drivers for social protection in our country. We are the country with 249 million population ranked amongst the 43 countries most exposed to poverty risks. Um, all around 70% of population lives in rural areas. 30% um, population is food insecure. 36% um, population uh, is, um, is like out of school, the children, the uh, school age going children out of school. Uh, we have 21.9% population living below the poverty line. If you calculate with the cost of basic need poverty line, 
um, and but the World Bank's uh, poverty line uh, indicates 39.8 percent population living below the poverty line, and we have around 40 percent children between age of six to 59 months of stunted, which is basically an evidence of of the issue of this food insecurity. Uh, this slide is quickly um, the um, uh, explanation of the stunting figures: 17.7 um, percent. Wasting 40.2 uh, is the stunting, um, and 31.5% uh, is the underweight. And, and this stunting issue we are facing since 1960 is almost linear line. Um, and we are trying to um, uh, you know, address this issue with different interventions. Uh, we all know the role of social protection um, and the cash transfer, particularly we can end extreme poverty and create more inclusive societies by developing human capital and social protection programs can help communities adapt to climate related shocks and stress, such as by providing safety net insurance mechanism and access to essential services. Um, and social protection can alleviate poverty and enhance livelihood, reducing the vulnerability of individuals and communities to uh, climate change. And for that, probably we need to invest more um, in people through nutrition, healthcare, quality education, jobs, and skill. Uh, Benazir Income Support Program in this all background was established back in 2008 as country's largest social safety net uh, with the objective to provide financial assistance to economically distressed persons and families. Um, we have 91% beneficiaries either ultra poor, poor, or vulnerable due to poverty due to various shocks facing multiple deprivations such as access to education and health, largely with insecure livelihood opportunities, dependent on casual labor, informal worker and daily wages. Um, only 19% of adult women in beneficiary households are literate and a majority of the, the beneficiaries were lacking the national ID, which is the basic requirement for getting benefits back in 2008. So these were the core initiatives are of Benazir Income Support Program. We have a database of 35 million households, um, which is being, uh, which is dynamic and updated, being updated on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, our all programs are, are targeted programs based on our national socioeconomic registry. Um, and we have a court program, uh, unconditionally cash transfer program started in 2008. And we are covering 9 million families through this program. And then we have two conditional cash transfer programs. Um, first one is focusing on 7.5, focusing on education. We, we are covering primary to high secondary education and currently 7.5 million children are benefiting from the program. And we also have another conditional cash transfer program linked with health and nutrition started back in 2016, uh, through which we are providing specialized nutritious food to a pregnant lactating woman and children under two years and the main focus of this program is to prevent stunting. And uh, we have around 0.8 million families um, part of this program. And then we have small scale undergrad scholarship program covering 92,000 uh, students. And time to time, we are also implementing our emergency cash program, which is shock responsive. And our biggest, uh, bigger uh, programs were during COVID. And recently we, we also, uh, implemented our programs, the shock responsive program in our flood back in uh, July, August, 2022. Uh, to just high, to just share it with you, the kind of database we are managing. So the 35 million households, we have um, the information of all the households on agriculture and livestock, land holding by area and the socioeconomic status. Uh, cultivated land, uh, crops types, uh, access to microfinance institutions. And we also have information of individuals, professionals like season, seasonal paid employees, day, daily wage laborers uh, linked with agriculture, own cultivator, um, sharecropper, livestock or contract cultivator, unpaid family worker, contributing family helper. And with the help of all this data, we are actually implementing our targeted programs, um, whether it's unconditional and conditional cash transfer programs, and also the targeted subsidies that we are managing, uh, this targeted subsidy for um, wheat, flour, and seed um, that we are managing through, these, uh, through this database. To just uh, share it with you, the 9 million families that we have uh, who are getting 
uh, benefit from the program, 70% uh, belong to the rural um, area of our country and only 30% are from urban. And, and, and amongst that, uh, around 12% engage in agri-related professions, um, the, the family that we are, are providing uh, the cash transfer with. So uh, the impact of individual consumption, so this slide will let you know that uh, the average consumption per family for, for bottom two quantiles is around $90 in our country. And as per global practices, you have to cover 20 to 25% of the total consumption of the family. And our cash transfer program, the unconditional cash transfer is covering around, uh, providing around $11, which is around 12% around of the total consumption. And but with the with the with the component of, uh, component of the conditional cash transfer program, we are covering around seventeen percent of the total consumption of the family, and um, so out of this twenty five thousand, this ninety dollar um, thirty six percent is basically related to food and, and non alcoholic beverages, and BISP um, through provision of this unconditional and conditional cash transfer, this eleven dollar plus the conditional cash transfer amount. As per impact evaluation baseline study, more than 60% expenditure is going towards food consumption. Um, and the rest is all uh, you can see is 40%. So uh, the cash transfer has a major contribution in meeting the uh, food consumption of, of the families uh, that we are, are sporting with. So this, is, this slide will basically tell you how we are actually um, uh, helping in creating the uh, economic activity, the local economic activity in the rural areas. So our recipient is the woman. Um, so we are also, uh, you know, addressing this gender inequality issue through that. So she's the recipient of unconditional and conditional cash transfer. So, you know, uh, the rich population and the upper middle class, so their contribution is more towards, um, I would say the international economy because they used to invest and they used to spend money on the on on, a, on branded shopping, but the the poorest of the poor recipient is basically contributing to the local economy. So um, so basically, um, uh, the cash transfer that we are feeding in and helping in increasing access to transportation, tele telecommunication, and credit for household supplies. Uh, the individual impact is is there is effect on agriculture, labor, and production, and and non for non farm trade. Um, local market demand supply is being impacted, transportation business and telecom business is being impacted. And the most important impact that we are driving through to our initial cash transfer is the consumption, especially the food related expenditure and, uh, and the woman empowerment uh, and through uh, improved nutrition uh, with the help of the cash transfer. So that is all from my side, and I would um, would love to respond to questions uh, from the audience. Thank you very much for patience hearing. Thank you so much. I think it's um, a super interesting example as well of the of the very comprehensive coverage, um, and the way that the system grew over time is also super interesting. Um, let me pass over to the to the two panelists we have to sort of get some first reactions, and then I know that people are keen to ask questions. So. My colleague over to Valerie um, from ILO, um, can you, building on what we just heard, can you tell us why you consider social protection important for just transitions and social justice in agri-food systems? And maybe also how the need for agri-food system transformation could be better linked to a political agenda for universal social protection? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lorraine. Um, yes, uh, first I would like to, to remind, I mean, we had the good examples of Brazil and Pakistan, but uh, I would like to to have a look a little bit at the social protection situation in the rural economy uh, over uh, um, overall. So we estimate that globally, uh, more than three billion people live in rural areas, and one billion in the are working in the agriculture sector. Um, and as was mentioned already by all the presenters, rural populations really face uh, higher risks of poverty, malnutrition, hunger poor health, uh, work-related injuries, natural disasters, and, and the impact of, of climate change. Um, so they have, we estimate that they have three times higher risk um, to live in extreme poverty compared to people in urban areas. 
Um, and as was mentioned by all the presenters, social protection is, is a key policy tool to, to address poverty and vulner vulner vulnerability in, rural, in the rural uh, areas. Um, however, despite um, this high and increasing risks um, uh, of poverty and malnutrition and vulnerability that, that they face, rural, rural workers and their families are today the least uh, protected. Um, we estimate, for instance, that as, as regards access to health care, so social health protection, 56% um, of the people uh, living in rural areas uh, don't have any access to social health protection uh, compared to 22% uh, in urban among urban populations. So this is the, the situation we are in. Uh, and um, just uh, transitions and social justice in, in agri-food systems uh, for the ILO means that um, all the workers uh, and, uh, should have uh, access to decent work uh, in rural areas. So decent work means uh, dignity, means equality, means a fair income, uh, safe working conditions, and obviously uh, social protection. Um, so universal social protection is for us really a key tool for achieving decent work um, in the agri-food systems. And an interesting uh, piece of work that we wanted to share with you is uh, in May this, of this year, um, there has been a, a major um, sectoral discussions uh, at the ILO um, that led to the development of policy guidelines uh, for the promotion of decent work in uh, the agri-food uh, sector. Uh, this document was adopted by um, governments, workers and employers um, from all member states of the ILO, so 187 member states. And these guidelines really recognize, uh, among many, many recommendations, the importance of universal social protection for the workers in the agri-food sector. And so they really urge uh, member states uh, to realize the human right uh, to social protection for these workers. So how, how this can happen? Uh, first, um, we need to ensure that uh, rural, sorry, I have a, I have an infection, so it's difficult for me to speak today, but I will manage. Um, don't worry, it's, you're very clear, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Uh, first, we need to ensure that um, rural workers, um, including the seasonal and the migrant uh, workers in rural areas, are covered uh, by social security law and by labor law and social security law. Um, this is super important. This is for us really the first step to guarantee their right to social security. We have heard about several cash transfers, both Bosa Familia, Benazir Income Support Program, um, in some countries, this type of programs are embedded in law. In others, there are more ad hoc uh, mechanisms that can be uh, dismantled from one day to the other. We believe at the ILO that if you really want to uh, exercise a right, you need to have a law. Uh, and then uh, beyond uh, the legislation, it's of course uh, super important to uh, implement this law, otherwise the right is just uh, an illusion. Um, and the, so this transformation of from law to really um, effective coverage is not auto automatic. In many cases, um, there is a need either to design uh, programs uh, that are really uh, responding to the needs uh, and the, the situation of, of workers and their families in rural areas. In others, uh, it is, uh, in, you can start with a social security scheme that exists, but you really need to to adapt it to the to these realities, and um, there are many examples uh, of uh, flexibility measures, adaptation that have really um, uh, led to massive extension of social protection in rural areas. Um, Renato has mentioned the Bolsa Familia in Brazil. I would like to also uh, mention in Brazil another another scheme, which is a contributory uh, rural pension scheme that covers both uh, wage workers and agricultural uh, producers. Um, and the type of adaptations that, that was uh, introduced um, is, for instance, in the ways uh, social security contributions are calculated. Um, they are calculated in percentage of the wage in, in case um, uh, we are talking about agricultural workers. But for producers, uh, so 
uh, farm owners, they are calculated, the contributions are calculated as a percentage of the sales value um, of the crop or the, ha the harvest. So you can see that really you can, uh, countries can are already introducing many, many adaptations so that um, these schemes really um, answer the needs and the constraints of the agricultural workers. Um, there are also other examples, such as in Ecuador, where um, a third of the population lives in rural areas and um, they have established this uh, Seguro Social Campesino, so the farmer's social insurance scheme that provides access to health care, maternity benefits, disability and old age benefits to uh, farmers and fishermen um, and also their family members. Uh, and here, uh, what is interesting is that the contributions, so social security contributions are heavily subsidized by the government, so that, uh, of course, uh, to increase accessibility of this scheme. Um, and also another um, interesting feature is that it's the farmers organizations, so it's associations, cooperatives, etc., that are responsible for registering uh, their members to the social security scheme. Um, so the, these approaches are successful and at the ILO and together with FAO, we are documenting them um, because they really address the specific barriers um, that uh, workers in the rural areas face when they want to affiliate social security. This can be legal barriers, this can be administrative or financial barriers. Financial barriers is like, for instance, because the contributions are too high. So if there is a subsidy of the government, this really helps. Um, this can be barriers linked to the lack of organization uh, or insufficient uh, information. And I just wanted to mention that we have published together with FAO a paper on ways to extend social protection uh, to rural populations. I hope it can be shared with the audience. Um, so in addition to all these elements, I wanted to flag also the, the importance of uh, representation and uh, ensuring that all these schemes that are developed uh, in the rural areas try as much as possible to involve uh, organizations that represent the workers and the employers in the ag agriculture sector. Um, this is the case of Mexico, for instance, that has um, developed uh, uh, agreements, collective agreements in the sector of the sugarcane, the sugarcane agribusiness, um, where um, the Mexican uh, Social Security Institute uh, has every every year discussions with workers and employers, the producers and the workers um, in this uh, uh, sugarcane agribusiness sector to really um, ensure the affiliation of the workers uh, to the social security to facilitate also the collection of contributions. Um, and uh, and this has allowed them for each campaign now to, to affiliate around 100,000 uh, workers. Uh, so uh, all these examples show um, many efforts actually to expand social protection to workers uh, in the uh, agriculture sector and really to, to contribute to transform the informal employment, which is uh, prevailing uh, in, in the agricultural sector, into what we call descent work um, at the ILO. And this, um, this transformation from informal to formal, formal work or descent work um, contributes also to the overall rural development that is inclusive. Um, and but social protection alone, I mean, it's it's key, as all the presenters have said, but it's not sufficient. Uh, if we are talking about developing uh, the agri agri food system, uh, it's more through the, the development of integrated and combined uh, policy approaches and measures and incentives that this is this can happen. And actually, the examples that were given on, from Pakistan and from Brazil showed that actually it was not only one policy, but it was more a set of different policies that are very important, and they, it's very important to link them together. Uh, we were in a, in a joint mission with a number of colleagues from FAO World Food Program a few, few three weeks ago in Malawi. Um, and here, it's clear that for the development of the agriculture and the, this shift from uh, subsistence farming to um, more productive um, uh, value chains in the in the in the area of uh, agriculture production. There is a need, of course, to to facilitate access to social protection. There is today no social protection system in Malawi for like eighty percent of the population, 
There is a need to facilitate access to markets and commercialization. There is a need to uh, support the transformation of agricultural products to increase the added value of the final products. There is a need to um, implement skills development strategies and TVETs that are adapted. There is a need to facilitate access to finance. Today, uh, microfinance is at 30% of rate of interest, so it's just unaccessible. Uh, uh, to combat child labor, etc. So there are many, many different policies that need to be uh, put in place uh, together. And this is exactly the type of work that we do as part of the Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transitions. It's a joint UN initiative. It's a what the UN system calls a high impact initiative. There is one of the 12 high impact initiatives that will contribute to the transformation and the acceleration of the SDGs. And in all countries that, um, that are interested in implementing the accelerator, uh, the development of this type of integrated policy approaches in the ag agri-food system seems to be really one of the priorities, one of the uh, entry points. Um, and it, this will have most probably impact on the livelihood, of course, of the agriculture workers and their families. It will support the development of more productive um, value chains in the agriculture sector that will lead also to food security at country level. And uh, it's also linked and contributes to the environmental sustainability, for instance, by, of course, uh, strengthening the resilience um, of agricultural workers and their families in rural populations in general to climate uh, shocks and other shocks. So, uh, yeah, so I, I hope that we can continue this discussion at some of our point on this on the preliminary results of the global accelerator and we have we are jointly organizing a, a big event uh, during the SDG summit on the 17th of September on the global accelerator um, and in particular it's linked to the agri-food systems so thank you thank you so much Valerie um, very interesting and I think um, a number of the things you said were reflected in our presentations and give some sense of you know, the way that um, you started by talking about rural systems, but we had also seen, of course, from the present presentation from Brazil that there's a, a, a need, a growing need in urban systems as well. And I think you gave a very comprehensive overview of um, the different international mechanisms in place. Um, my colleagues put the link to the paper that you mentioned in the chat as well. So that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm gonna pass over. I have a question for um, Dr. Badian from an African perspective. Can you tell us why this um, agenda is very important for the transformation of agri-food systems? And can you say a little bit about the trends, gaps, and opportunities you've identified in terms of designing and implementing integrated social protection, which would contribute to agri-food system transformation in Sub-Saharan Africa? I take note, for example, of the statistic Valerie mentioned about Malawi, right, where 80% of the population is not being covered. So over to you. Thank you very much for being here. All right, thank you very much. I'll be sharing <clears throat> a couple of slides uh, briefly as a reaction to what I heard uh, from Brazil, Pakistan, but also just uh, in the, uh, the, the comments uh, here. Um, social protection is going to be um, playing a double role in the transformation of food systems uh, across African countries. It's first to drive down the massive level of chronic vulnerability uh, across communities but also um, helping build preparedness and crisis response capacity uh, in the era of climate crisis. We're just not dealing with transforming value chains with all its, I'm sorry, uh, food systems with all its challenges, but also in the time of climate crisis. And you're starting at a very high level of poverty uh, and entrenched uh, chronic vulnerability. So social protection should be targeting both uh, this chronic level, as well as um, boosting preparedness and crisis response capacity. Now, if you're doing that at a low level of budgetary resources, social protection cannot be primarily an entitlement. It has to be a mean to boost productivity, asset building, alongside dealing with the health and the nutrition issues. So it's, it's a much more complex setting than in an, in an environment where you can have uh, an entitlement approach to that. Uh, but also for the same reasons, social protections have to be uh, very targeted, very efficient to stretch the limited resources uh, that, that we have. I'm going to be sharing a couple of uh, slides
to um, try and um, uh, illustrate uh, using examples. Uh, okay, I need to stop something else here. Um, I'm using, um, okay, I need to stop using another program. Okay, so now I can share my screen. I use example of Malawi, what a nice coincidence because Valerie just talked about Malawi and I'll also be uh, showing an example from Senegal, okay? So policy in the area of social protection in the context of uh, limited public resources and large scale product vulnerability where you cannot be everywhere and you don't have the resources to be everywhere has to be targeted, uh, but also has to understand the nature and the drivers of vulnerability. So you can focus both on them during normal times, but also be better prepared to respond in the times of crisis. So I think most African countries are approaching social protections in a more generic fashion, trying to get resources out there to the vulnerable populations, trying to compensate for shocks, but the impact, the sustainability, the durability of action uh, requires a refined approach to that. And that's what we're trying to get at here. Uh, in this case, it was during COVID. We wanted in Malawi to understand exactly where the most vulnerable communities and households are located. This is fundamental information to have for countries to have the best targeted, the most effective social protection program. What's driving vulnerability among these communities has to do with the level of malnutrition, uh, the food poverty, the distance to health sectors, uh, health facilities, uh, the uh, access to infrastructure, the prevalence of uh, chronic diseases. There's so many different things that are reducing the capacity of these communities to absorb shocks. Uh, even in normal times, they are driving down the capacity to survive. In that sense, having a good understanding of the different drivers, and the list can go longer. You can bring in climate risk, for example, drought risk, water availability risk, heat risk, whatever you might want to bring in here. But a concept is you have a composite vulnerability indicator that allow you to locate the most vulnerable communities and be ready to act in times of crisis and in times of uh, normal times to focus on those drivers. If it's, for example, prevalence of chronic diseases is the biggest constraints to livelihoods, then you focus on tackling chronic diseases during normal times. It is, if it is um, a, a high poverty, food poverty, you focus on boosting productive uh, capacities access uh, to assets in normal times before you have the crisis. And when the crisis hit, you know where to focus. You see the ruined areas are the most exposed with the lowest capacity to absorb shocks in normal times before the crisis hit. It's just similar to what most municipalities do, do in temperate zone areas where you have snowstorms. They know before the snowstorms come where to position the snow plow to be able to deal with the snowstorm. African countries and others need to be in that position to know exactly the places which have the least absorption capacity to deal with shocks and be there and be prepared with the right programs, the right equipment uh, and the right tools and the right information so that they can deliver. But to do that also requires that one is capable of tracking progress in the short run. These indicators you see here are not movable in the short run. You cannot change stunting within a few months, it takes years. You cannot move food poverty within months and take years. So we're proposing another indicator so that while we're acting in the short run, we can measure progress and to see whether we're moving the needle and more importantly, whether we're returning normalcy. The biggest really issue around shocks, vulnerability and protection in African countries is that it should not be acceptable that any shock that comes just leads to wide ranging disruptions that tend to be perpetuated over time and therefore increasing the level of chronic, chronic vulnerability. So being able to be better positions to follow when we respond, to track, to measure, and know that we're making progress is important. For that we're proposing 
using micronutrient intake or deficiency gaps, which is just like the fever thermometer in an emergency room, allow you to track whether your emergency interventions are having an impact on households. You can measure consumptions on a monthly, quarterly, or on a half uh, yearly basis, and then see whether your interventions allow you to move the needle and to restore normalcy after a shock. What it also does, it allows you to focus your interventions if you're uh, distributing foods to know which foods in which communities will have the best impact in restoring nutritional status among these households, right? You can get to this. Here we have just shown six micronutrients. Uh, we have done this for about 15 countries and it's about a dozen micronutrients that we track. So that when you intervene, uh, you know the community situation, both on production and consumption side. Uh, if it's a subsidy, um, an income transfer, food distribution, you align that with the most deficient micronutrients. So you really uh, hit two targets. You are uh, 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 restoring nutritional status, but also you can track your impact and your effectiveness as you go. So to, to, to summarize basically, uh, social protection in the context of transforming food systems and the context of climate crisis requires better targeting in particular when you're dealing with limited budget and resources. Uh, you target better the communities and the households across different dimensions of vulnerability. Once you have that information, you can zero in during normal times, not just during crisis, during normal times on those dimensions that are driving vulnerability in different communities. They're not the same. So that kind of granularity is gonna be important. But also when you intervene during shocks, you need to know that you're making progress. You need to not only target the interventions to where people are hurting the most, but also you have to be in a position to track and know that you're making progress and therefore are reducing chronic vulnerability as you go. So let me stop here and look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Usman, and very, um, very detailed maps. It's very interesting to see the the variation even within a single a single national context. Um, colleagues, we uh, I had additional questions for our panelists, um, but I see also that I would like to leave enough time for um, people who are listening in to ask questions. There are two questions in the chat, and I also appreciate that um, um, both Hanato and Navid have answered a couple of questions which have come up. Um, maybe I could start by reading out the two questions uh, in the chat, and then if anybody else has a question, they can either raise their hand or put it in the Q&A. Uh, so the first one is about um, Ecuador specifically, and how rural cooperatives are facilitating the access to social insurance in Ecuador through the Campesino scheme. I think, Valerie, this question might be to you because you mentioned Ecuador. And uh, Greta would like to know what's their specific role uh, in terms of targeting or collective access, and if you have any insights on that. And then there's another question, um, I think re regarding Pakistan from, um, from Jung Rin Kim, uh, asking about the uptake rate of the social um, protection programs. And so the question is, uh, is the take up rate 100%? Um, it, it would be really great if it is, because he mentions that non-take up is a serious issue related to targeting measures. And maybe this question could go both to Hanato and to, to Navid. So let me pass the floor first to Valerie, and then I'll pass to the, the other panelists. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I don't have all the information. What I know is that there are, you know, in, in social security, you can either register as an individual, like if you are a self-employed worker, or um, as a, either as a salaried worker within an enterprise, or you can have um, sort of a group uh, membership group insurance and uh, I think this is a little bit what is happening um, in Ecuador where um, the farmers organizations are really um, ensuring that uh, all their members are registered so it's like a group you know a membership um, which um, which is um, I think a, a great um, has many advantages because for the Ecuadorian Social Security Institute, it reduces a little bit the, the, the cost or the management cost and time in uh, spent 
in uh, identifying the farmers, in registering each of them, in collecting the contributions, etc. So since the, the farmers organization is doing it, uh, it's like a, a sort of intermediary agent that uh, um, yeah, really helps uh, this, this, uh, the registration of uh, all the farmers. And it also, um, from a, a pure insurance, um, a theory of insurance uh, perspective, it also reduces the risks um, that you have um, uh, farmers who really need, it, need, it, need social insurance the most that will register and others who need less or perceive that they need less will not register. Here uh, with a group insurance, you take everybody. And so it really uh, creates a sort of a solidarity within the group. Um, and this is also an advantage when you, when you do uh, insurance mechanisms. So I think, I hope it answers. We are, uh, we have, a collection of country briefs uh, on our website and once in a while we, we publish them in a book. This is the book from 2019 and the book from 2023 is going to be published in September. Um, and uh, there there is the, the case of um, uh, this th this case. I will try to find the link to, uh, uh, to the case uh, and, and put it in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Navi, can I ask if you want to come in on the question first about uptake? Yeah, so basically, uh, the uh, uptake um, of um, the, roughly 97%. Uh, and the reason for uh, this 3% is basically because of this biometric based payment mechanisms that uh, is in place. So around 3% basically usually facing the problem uh, because they are, bit, uh, you know, um, from the old age um, uh, group. So sometimes they feel they face some problems, but we try to we we, we usually try to resolve by um, by whitelisting them and 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 uh, giving them disbursement through other means um, modes of the payment systems. So ninety seven percent uptake is there, and let me share it with you that when we start disbursement of our cash transfer program, around seventy five percent withdraw the cash in the first seven to 10 days of, of the disbursement um, uh, schedule. Only 20 to 25% takes um, another two weeks to withdraw the cash. So uptake is quite high uh, that we have. And um, the rural uptake is, is quite high as compared to the urban uptake. Uh, the urban population slowly withdrawing their cash, but the rural quickly, like within a week, they they usually get their, their payments from uh, from their, their accounts. Great, thanks. Um, Hinata, do you want to add anything on that question? Or there was, um, we could also talk a little bit about the coordination amongst parts of government, which was something that you had already answered in the chat. I pass to you. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, I, I, I could try to address, address both briefly. So this, this issue of uptake is, is very crucial. So the in, in in case in our case, both the family and the cash transfer program, they need to enroll in the single registry, which is done through the social services, the, the networks. And um, especially during the last few years, there was not enough attention to properly targeting this. In some cases, uh, people were enrolled that shouldn't be in the program. Uh, because they would be uh, higher than the threshold of already uh, their basic income and, and some controls were relaxed in this aspect. On the other hand, there was not enough of an effort to find what we call the active search for people that have the right to be in the registry and receive the benefits, but they, and sometimes the, the, the what we call the population in a situation of uh, a street situation, also mendicancy and others uh, life situations like these, uh, in some cases are not informed. And, and now we are having quite a lot of success, even constraining a bit the intended budgets because in the, over the last few months, the program for this active uh, enrollment uh, has, has been going very well. So now we um the in the last uh, month of, of uh, June closing we had uh, three three thousand new people enrolled in the of families uh because the the, the program is directed at the families three thousand new families um three hundred thousand people in a uh, hundred uh, more as a hundred families enrolled in the program due to the active search 
So this this refinement process is ongoing, and the maintenance of the registry is a technical uh, challenge that uh, really needs to be addressed. Um, speak of technical challenges, this is also an issue of, of uh, coordination. So it is very important to have formal mechanisms in the country to uh, uh, a bit uh, force or lead the different agencies to coordinate. So food systems and food security and nutrition ranges across health, education, social services, uh, farming. So many different uh, ministries are involved. Uh, and uh, in some cases, so the, the example in Brazil, I, I answered uh, with a bit of detail in the, the chat uh, questions for, for all here to access, but uh, uh, it is uh, very important to build this uh, formal structure, which is in Brazil formalized via law and decrees that the ministries they have to get together, they are obligated to do a national conference every four years that then direct the strategy and the programs that have to be further refined and developed with these inputs from the civil society also formally organized with a proper governance of ways of representation. So uh, this is a process that has its own cost, of course, uh, but it's well worth it because it, it does provide uh, this political will and push behind uh, maintaining the policies, correcting course, uh, introducing new policy ideas. So one uh, landmark uh, law is the one that uh, obligates the, the procurements that municipalities do for the school meals program that at least 30% comes from family farming. This is something that was pushed by civil society for a number of years and was eventually adopted. So, uh, and also for the control of the registries in the municipalities. So if the services are going well. So a lot of this, if, if you build the structure, the network and, 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 and run the meeting, so eventually good things will happen. So that's the, 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 the lesson here that we've got for, for this coordination network. Thanks so much. I like the, the hopeful finish, <laughs> despite all the complications. <laughs> Yeah. Um, as I don't see any other questions or hands, though, uh, somebody can just sort of shout if they, if they do. I, I think I'm going to sort of pass for the penultimate word over to you, David, to ask you a, a sort of a question. If, if you had to summarize uh, what you've heard in two minutes, um, what do you think are the sort of key challenges that governments face in strengthening policies and improving investment for, um, in, you know, ensuring that there is adequate social protection to support agri-food system transformation? Well, I personally think we had two extraordinary presentations that are just absolutely full of lessons that I believe we can take on board. Of course, when you hear a case study, the first thing to do is to find out as much as possible. And then, having heard it, to take some of the ideas out of that case study and put them to the test in one's own setting. As I listened to Dr. Godinho, I found myself very much influenced by the history of what's happened in Brazil, particularly the whole political basis of Bolsa Familia, the whole political basis of work for school meals, and the absolute need to create this short circuit between farmers schools and people. I also was impressed that there were some careful analyses of the impact of social protection on people's well-being. And I was particularly interested in what was emerging about obesity reduction. This is a very, very difficult area in which to find any kind of association. And I noticed that Renato was being quite cautious when interpreting it. So the, the lessons of history are, are really important. Then I was listening very carefully to the presentation from Navid. Once again, a very large scale initiative, a lot of careful design work, extremely thoughtful approaches, both to getting adequate coverage and we had some lovely statistics of that, but also for ensuring that people benefit 
from the protection they receive. And then a lot of emphasis, I thought, on, on how best to, to better adjust what's in, on offer to people's situations. When I listened to Valerie, I thought, what an enormous body of knowledge there is with ILO, and how marvelous that this social protection accelerator is designed to basically get the experiences from different parts of the world and bring them together. And then Usman, Usman Badian, with his detailed case study of Malawi, just, I thought, offered us a very valuable extra thing, which was, if you're tight on money, then it does pay to adapt your social protection offer to what are determined by government and others to be the highest priority for people's well-being. I know that this is not always seen as the correct way to go, but after all, everybody is trying to cope with extreme shortages, and I found that very helpful. Now, that was longer than two minutes, Lauren, but I couldn't just talk about one, and I must say, it, that's just a very partial impression by me, but, but what a privilege to hear this, and I'm jolly glad it's being recorded, because if I was teaching this, I would want to use at least some of this material as case study for practitioners, because this is how you learn from the people who are really doing it. Thank you. Thank you, and don't worry about going over the, the time because you helped do my job, which was to close a little bit and by summarizing um, the insights. And I agree with you first that we heard some excellent case studies and some, um, some very good interventions. And it's great that it's been recorded because I'm sure that others will, will want to, to draw on those results. I think as we're one minute over time, I would like to just sort of say um, one major thing moving forward. Well, the first is obviously to thank all of you for participating and to our panelists and discussants for being here and for, for, um, for making it such a rich conversation. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that given that uh, as various people have mentioned, we have the U UN Food System Summit plus two stock taking moment happening next week in Rome, uh, where I'm sure that social protection will be um, um, uh, a critical part of the agenda and showcased, I wanted to mention the coalition of action um, of the Food System Summit on Social Protection for Food Systems Transformation, which is hosted by the Global Coalition on Universal Social Protection. And there are a number of stakeholders, including FAO, WFP, UNICEF, ILO, IRC, and countries like Pakistan, as well as Chile and Peru, who have already joined this coalition of action. And I think it's really important to make sure that this kind of seminar, which has provided us a lot of information and allowed us to exchange some, some views on challenges and, and approaches, um, can be facilitated through that coalition to provide comprehensive support uh, for countries that are looking to build, reform, expand, um, strengthen their social protection systems. Um, so thank you so much for, for your time. And, you know, this dialogue series on social protection is going to continue after the summer break. And I'm sure that our colleagues will send you additional information about all of that. And so thank you very much for being here. And I'll close with that. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for getting up so early, Renato. <laughs> yes, I should have said that. Thank you so much <laughs> to colleagues in Latin America for being awake so early. Bye-bye. <laughs>